Mighty God. Again, we come before you, Father, with hearts full of love and devotion. We do assemble on your mountain. We are the redeemed. And Father, we thank you for that blessing. We thank you for the love that you have shown us that is immeasurable, Father, by any, any universal standard. You are a God of greatness, a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of justice, a God of power, a God of might, a God of wisdom. Father, you are the God of all things, and we love you, and we praise you. But Father, we ask that you give us that power, which you so magnificently manifest in each and every one of us. We ask that you lay that power down in this ministry of McCrest. Help us this week coming up to effectively show others your will for them, your love, your presence, your identity to bring as many people to Christ as humanly possible. But Father, we also ask that you be with our, our luncheon this afternoon. Help us to open our hearts so that we give, we give cheerfully and heavily, Father, so that we can glorify you, so we can all take share in that glory. Father, I ask that you bless us. I ask that you make us yours and yours alone. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to talk about a movie. Shock, right? Okay, here we go. Um, it's actually not really a movie I'm talking about so much as I'm talking about a really good movie that's based on an even better book. Um, but how many of you have ever read The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas? Anybody? Okay, all right. The English teacher has. Of course she has. Uh, <laughs> the great book. Excellent book. In fact, one of the most Christian books out there. Okay, that's actually not considered to be a Christian book. But it really is. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it's the story of Edmund Dantes. Okay? And Edmund Dantes is a very simple guy. He's a sailor. But he, he can't read. He can't write. He, he knows sailing. And that's it. And when I say that he's a simple man, I mean that his life doesn't have a lot of extravagance to it. In fact, the only thing he really has in his life of any real value besides his love for sailing is his fiance, his betrothed, Mercedes. And she is this beautiful woman, and he's grown up with his best friend, who also happens to serve on the same ship that he serves on. But his best friend is a man of great wealth, of great prestige, of great power. And by all accounts, their role should be that the man of great wealth and the man of great power should be the happiest. And the man who only has a simple, tiny, poverty life should be miserable, but it's reversed. You see, for all of his wants and his needs, Edmund Dantes is one of the most content men, men who's ever lived because he finds contentment in his love of, of, love of the ocean, his love of his friend, and the love of the woman he loves. And his friend, his best friend, who's grown up with his whole life, sees this, and it fills him with that jealous, green-eyed monster. Great envy. Great envy. He wants, he wants the happiness that Edmund has. Well, for those of you who know the story, what he does, and he, he, fo he, fixates, he fixates on Mercedes. And so what he does is he contrives this really elaborate plan to get Edmund Dantes arrested for treason. And he sends him off to prison. Edmund Dantes spends the next, I forget the exact time, but it's somewhere around 20 years in the Chateau d'If, which is one of the worst prisons in France. And he gets lost. I mean, he loses everything. They beat him every day for no reason. Every day for no reason. He's locked in a little cell. He doesn't see the light of day. And it's in that cell over the course of a few years that Edmund Dantes' faith in God dies. Until one day, he discovers that one of his fellow inmates, who used to be a priest, is digging his way to freedom. They develop a friendship with each other. And he discovers that this priest is not only an intelligent man in terms of literature, architecture, engineering, mathematics, but he's also a former soldier who's a masterful swordsman. And, and in return for him helping to dig his tunnel to get them both out of the Chateau d'If, 
He teaches Edmond Dantes everything he knows so that he can get out and get his what? Revenge. Good movie, right? Better book, but good movie. But the whole time, and they spend years doing this, the whole time that the priest is teaching him swordplay, mathematics, philosophy, engineering, all these things, he's also trying to teach him about God. Because while Edmund Dantes' faith is dead, the priest's faith couldn't be more alive. In the movie, I like, I like referencing the movie for this. Because what happens is, you guys know the rest of the story, he gets out of prison and he takes on the, he takes on the uh, uh, persona of the Count of Monte Cristo. He gets, this, he gets this great fortune that he finds out was stowed somewhere. The priest tells him about, you go here, there's all this wealth. He becomes one of the richest men in France and he takes on the persona of the Count of Monte Cristo. And it's very, it's very Batman-y. No wonder I love it. Okay, so, um, the, the here, here's the thing. Uh, in the movie, the, the movie really focuses more on this than really the book does, but the priest is, is played by Richard Harris. Do you guys know who Richard Harris was? Great actor. Um, and, and Jim Caviezel plays Edmund Dantes, and they are, they are digging their way out of the, the prison. They're about a year out from being free. Well, there's a cave-in. And the priest, who's already up there in age anyway, gets crushed by a large rock. And he pulls his friend out in a tunnel about yay, yay tall. He pulls his friend out of the tunnel back into the cell, and he's dying. He's coughing blood. It's, it's terrible. And he's saying, no, you can't die. You can't die. He loves this man. And, he, and, and the priest grabs him. As death takes hold, grabs him by the front of his tunic, his little shabby prison robes. He gets right in his face and he says, Do not seek vengeance. Vengeance will not sate you, Edmund Dantes. For the Lord said, Vengeance is mine. And Edmund Dantes, in the, even in the moment of the pain of losing his friend, he still his, his faith is not yet revived. He looks down at his friend, the priest, as he's dying. And he says, I don't believe in God. And Richard Harris, in his masterful way that he acts, he looks back up to him and he gets this little wistful look as life starts to leave him, this little, little crooked smile. And he says, oh, my friend, that's all right. He believes in you. And then he dies. It's a great story because at the end of it, in, in, in Emendante's cell, there's an there's a inscription on the wall that prisoner after prisoner has made deeper by scratching into. And even Edmund Dantes has added his own depth to it because it's something to do. And at the end of the story, he comes back to his cell and he sees it there and it really ratifies it. You know what, you, you, do you know what the, 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 the statement is? God will grant me justice. Beautiful story. If you haven't read it, Please read it. If you can't find the time to read it, I know you people are busy. Rent the movie. It's great. But this is not Jared's movie review. This is a sermon. So here we go. What did that have to do with anything? I love that line. It got me thinking. It's okay that you don't believe in God because what? God believes in you. Now, it's not okay that you don't believe in God. You should believe in God. But still, that line stuck with me. You see, church, we talk all the time about how we need to have faith in God, correct? We talk all the time about how we are required to express our faith, experience our faith, own our faith, share our faith, and it's, it's all about my faith, my faith, my faith, my faith. And we know what the word faith means, right? We've read Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things, what, unseen? Hold on to that, that, that definition for just a second. But church, how often do we talk about the faith that God has in us? How often do we talk about that? I don't know about you, but when I find out someone that I love and respect has faith in me, has confidence in me, it helps me perform the tasks that I have to perform all the easier. 
If I have somebody come up to me before I'm about to face some insurmountable challenge and they come up and they put their arm around me or they pat me on the back and say, you can do it, what? I believe in you. I know you can do this. That makes me more confident in my ability to succeed. Church, we don't just have faith in God. God has faith in us. And I can prove it to you. Because one of the greatest prayers ever recorded, and it's one of the greatest court prayers because it's one of Jesus' prayers, and Jesus owns the top three prayers of all time. Okay? They're all Jesus. But church, we have a prayer in John 17 of Jesus. And I don't know what, I don't know if you've ever thought about that. What does Jesus pray for? Now, he's given us some examples of what he prays for, but when he's just down by himself and all the time, I mean, think of all the <laughs> thousands of times he prayed that it isn't recorded what he said. What does Jesus pray for? Well, in this instance, I feel like Jesus prays for, pray, probably prayed for a lot of the same things that you and I pray for. Strength, encouragement, praying to, to praise God, to thank him for his blessings. But church, in this instance, Jesus prays, not for himself, but for you and me. And I mean that literally. For you, meaning you, and me, meaning me. John 17, real quick. It's a very powerful passage. We, we commonly refer to this as, as your chapter heading no doubt states, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And here's what he says in the first five verses. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. It's important to point that out because you'll remember that John doesn't write chronologically. He writes topically. And this is just, just a few days before Jesus' eventual arrest and crucifixion. So this is the buzzers counting down. <laughs> It's almost over. Jesus is, I, he is getting a lot more somber in his speech because he is facing his mortality. And now he knows the end has come and he, he feels it happening. And now he wants to be very clear with his disciples. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may what? Glorify you. Here we see the Trinity in action. Here we see the Godhead discussing amongst itself. The submission of the Son to the Father, though they're both God. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Now, what's important to point out about this statement is that up until this point, Jesus in John, John 14 through 16 has been talking specifically and predominantly not to all disciples, but to the twelve. John 14 is where he makes his famous statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says that to the 12 when they were asking him to clarify what is about to happen. He also makes the promise in John 16 that he will send the Holy Spirit, the helper to them, the counselor to them, so that they will be brought into remembrance of all things, everything that he said. This is a promise that is made to the, to the 12, not necessarily to us. Why? Because I don't know about you, but Christ has yet to fulfill that hope in me. I, I don't remember things. Stephanie can attest to that. I forget stuff all the time. But what he's saying is not giving them photographic memory. He's saying that after I die and I ascend into heaven, the Holy Spirit will come on you and will make you who you need to be so we can get this whole church thing rolling. I mean, how else do you explain the difference between, that occurs over 50 days between Peter at the crucifixion who denies Jesus three times, cursing the last time, and only 50 days later he goes to the Peter at Pentecost in Acts 2 where he says, men of Israel, hear these words. This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ and 3,000 people come forward. I have yet to preach a sermon that good. How does Peter go from that guy denying him to that guy getting 3,000 people to respond to a single sermon that's only about 10 minutes long? Peter's got game, y'all. How does he do that? 
because he had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus made him that promise that I will miraculously turn you in to the person, to the preacher, to the evangelist that you, Peter, need to be so that you can train others in the faith. Because remember what else Peter says in Acts 2. This promise is not just for you, but for who? Your children who are all what? Far off. That's you and me. And that's the promise of salvation. But in John 14 through 16, that's predominantly to the, to the 12. But then in John 17, in the same discussion, he switches gears and he says what? I pray not only for me, but for all to, to give eternal life to all whom you have what? Given him, him being Jesus. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world, what? Existed. This is a reference to the eternality of Jesus. There was never a moment in eternity past not just to the, to the beginning of the universe, but even before that, where Jesus wasn't the Son. Where the Father wasn't the Father. When the Holy Spirit wasn't the Holy Spirit. He is an eternal being. That just makes it so amazing that an eternal being would come concerned with you and me and would die on the cross for our sins. As we keep reading, we see more statements. Verse 8, For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received from them, and re- they have received them, and have come to know the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Verse 9, though, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Did you catch that? Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they might be what? One. One with who? Each other? That's part of it. That's a byproduct of this oneness follows naturally from it, but it's not just with each other. It's one with who? One with God. One with the Father. Even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. Did you catch that word? Guarded. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that Scripture might be fulfilled. That's a reference to Judas. But now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have joy, my joy fulfilled in themselves. Then we jump down to verse 20. I do not ask for these only, these being the twelve, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. They also may be in us, so that the world may what? Believe that you have sent me. I don't know if you caught some of the language Jesus used there, but it's very important. The word choice is very important. Why? Because notice what Jesus says he has done. He has said that he has received those whom the Father has sent. So what does that mean? Church, that means that Jesus loves us so much that he is not only willing to die for all of us, but he is always ready to receive those who come calling. You know what that means? That means that the Son of God, when he is presented with a soul who comes to him for salvation, drops everything. And stands ready to save. What is the most important thing to the Son of God? And by extension, to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. What is the most important thing? Not the running of His creation. Remember what He says, I pray not for the world. I don't pray for the world. world's burning down. Let it burn, is what Jesus says. 
I don't care about that. I made a mistake once with Stephanie. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? I made a mistake once with Stephanie. In my defense, I knew she was fine, which is why I did, I did this. But years and years and years ago, Stephanie called me. And she, had been, she, she was out driving around, and, and, and she was running a little bit late. And I knew she was going to be on some dirt roads. And she called me, and I was kind of already a little bit frustrated because I was expecting her to be home by now. And I'm like that. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> But she called me and she said, and I could tell she was a little distraught. And I said, what's wrong? She said, she said I, I, got, I, got into a little, I got into an accident. Car went off the road into a ditch. Now, if I had been a good husband in that moment, what should I have immediately asked? Are you okay? How many of you think that that's what Jared asked? What did Jared ask? Is the car okay? Big mistake. <laughs> Now, I knew she was fine because she's calling me, and if she's bleeding out, she doesn't call me. She calls the ambulance, okay? All right, but, but, I didn't know, and I should have asked. A couple of years later, another car accident. Not her fault, not her fault, but another car accident. She calls me, she said, I got into an accident, somebody hit me. Guess what I immediately asked? Are you Okay. Are you fine? Yeah, I'm fine. Good. How's the car? Because honestly, church, honestly. Now, I don't know, I don't know about you, but when your child calls you, or when your spouse calls you, or when a loved one calls you and says that something bad happened, something that put, potentially put my life in danger, and they haven't told you all the details, what's the first thing you think? What's the first thing you ask? What's the first expression you give? Are you okay? Because at the end of the day, despite the funniness of that story, do I care about the car? We can get another car. I can replace a car. Can I replace the love of my life? Never. Can I replace my children? Can I replace my siblings, my parents, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ? Can I replace you? Can I replace this church? Absolutely not. We know where the priority lies. And what Jesus is saying is that his priorities, like Jared's were in that first story, are never out of whack. They are never off base. They are never mislabeled. God's priorities are always perfectly categorized, organized, and implemented. Every time. It doesn't matter what's going out in Alpha Centauri which God is also the God, God of, doesn't matter what's going on out there because if it just us, a tiny little speck on this tiny little blue marble in some backwater arm of some random galaxy in the midst of the almost infinite ocean of the cosmos, just us compared to God, microbes are bigger. Atoms are bigger than us to God. And even as small as we are, church, he still loves us enough to when we say, Lord, save me, he comes running. I'm going to say that again because I don't feel like you quite got it because I feel like that kind of, got, that kind of had an amen coming after it. God comes running. And how praiseworthy does that make him? But not only that, not only does he say, I pray not for the world, but those whom you have given me, standing ready to save them. He says this, I have guarded them. I have guarded them. I wonder how many times Jesus has stood as your shield and my shield, and we don't even know it. And we don't even know it. How many times has Christ, you know, I, I can't help but wonder, every time somebody has something horrible happen to them, one of the first people they almost always blame is God. And they say, why God? Why did you let this happen? Why couldn't you have stopped it? Who's to say that he didn't do just that a billion other times in your life? How many times has he saved you? Not just spiritually, but physically. How many times has he protected you? Not just spiritually, but physically. Why? Because Jesus is such a God of love, care, and devotion to his people that he not only actively saves them, but he actively protects them. Just like a parent protects their children. Just like a husband protects his wife. 
He defends our honor at every conceivable turn. And if that doesn't make you want to praise him, I don't know what will. But then finally, church, he says this, I pray not only for these, but those who are yet to come who believe in their word that they may also be one. Jesus has this love, this compassion, this belief in every human being, not just the ones who believe in him back. I like the song we sing, I love the Lord because he first loved me. You familiar with that song? But you know what's an amazing thought, brothers and sisters? That the reverse is not true. Yes, it's true that I love the Lord because he first loved me. That's what brought me to love him. That's what educated me to his existence and and my devotion to him. I love him because he saved me. And he loved me enough to do that. But church, the reverse is not true. Imagine a world in where, where we have a God, a universe where we have a God who only loves those who love him back. Guess what he is immediately not anymore? God. God loves everyone regardless of the existence of their love for him. And he looks at them and he sees what they could be. And he hopes and he longs for them to meet the potential he gave them. In closing, I can't help but think of that scene in that prison cell. And I can't help but put myself in the shoes because here's, here's something interesting. Here's something to think about. Because typically when people read the book, The Count of Monte Cristo, or they see the movie, the, the, the title character, the, the point of view character that you're, you, most people put themselves in the shoes of is Edmund Dantes, the guy who lost everything and is trying to get it back, trying to get revenge. But try this on for size. Imagine being the priest and not Edmund. Imagine being trapped in a cell for decades with a man who hates God as much as you love him. Imagine how frustrating that would be. Imagine how infuriating at times it would be to have him shoot down the God that you know and love as much as that priest did. How could he do it? How could he keep going? How couldn't he call the guards and tell them about the tunnel just so they'll take that guy away? After decades of this, how could he not do that? You know how he did it? By not seeing Edmund for who he is, but by seeing him as he could be. I don't believe in God. That's all right. He believes in you. When God looks at you, what does he see? Church, if he just saw the sin, would he have ever died? If he just saw what we do, how we fail him, would he have ever gone to the cross? No. Because it wouldn't have been worth it. When God thinks about it, think of all the times we let him down. All the times we fail him. All the times we, we fall short of his glory. Paul, we do this so often, and Paul even goes as far to say that there are none righteous, no, not one. Church, if the cross was a decision made on the basis of statistics, would it have ever happened? So why does he die? Not because he sees the sin, not because he sees the sinful actions, not because he sees the way we're terrible to him and terrible to each other, but church, because he looks at his creation and he sees Not who we are, but who we could be. And he prays for it. I pray that you make them what? One. One with each other. But more importantly, Father, one with you. Jesus prays for you right now. He prayed for you in these words. He's praying for you still. He longs. Because remember what the definition of faith is? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And the what? Certainty of things unseen. It might be, church, that your faith is unseen this morning. That all the things that endear God to you 
are invisible to you and me because of the life you live and the decisions you made. Maybe you've made a life of sin and you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, well, why should I come to a God that doesn't care about me? Devalue yourself of that thought right now. Because God not only cares about you, He not only loves you, He not only guards and protects you, He longs for you to be the way He intended you to be. He wants you to have the life He made for you. He wants you to have the joy that He gave to you through His Son. And it's yours this morning for the claiming. But in order to do it, you're going to have to stop seeing yourself as you are and start seeing yourself as He sees you. If you don't believe in God this morning, think about the fact that he believes in you. Or maybe you've given yourself over to him and you you haven't been living that way and you've been living like someone who doesn't have that joy. We can help you this morning as well. But I can't help but think that maybe there's someone here who's kept themselves from God because they thought he couldn't be reached, he couldn't be touched, he couldn't be he couldn't be experienced but he couldn't be closer, church. He's right here. And all that stands between you and him is an aisle and some water. If that's you this morning, the invitation is yours. Please respond. Come down the aisle as we stand and sing.